All right, uh, today is June 12th, 2015. This is Todd Moy with the Civil Rights in Black and Brown Oral History Project, and I am speaking with Mr. Estrus Tucker here in Fort Worth. So thank you again for making time for us today. We really Todd Moy is a professor in UNT's Department of History, and the Civil Rights in Black and Brown Project seeks to tell the stories of African-American and Mexican-American civil rights activists across Texas. The project spans time and place, with professors and students from UNT, TCU, UT Arlington, and UT Austin traveling as far north as Amarillo and as far south as El Paso to collect interviews about everything from political campaigns and police reforms to school and housing desegregation. Some of my best memories of learning and, 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 and living were in the schools in the Como community and some of the most traumatic uh, one of the most traumatic in particular is associated with that. So, uh, Estrus Tucker is a Fort Worth-based activist, Jr. and though he was born two months before the Supreme Court handed down its landmark Brown v. Board of Education decision in 1954, it wasn't until his senior year of high school that Fort Worth ISD began desegregation efforts. The process looked like this. Instead of funneling resources and students into all of its schools, the district closed three of its four African-American high schools, including Como, the school Tucker had attended, and sent African-American students out of the communities where they felt most supported and into majority white schools. When Como High School closed, Tucker says, in high he felt school. like so an orphan. She had, for years at Western Hills, had one year. And the things that I remember, and again, as a student, uh, I really haven't went back to try to validate or fact check all of it, mm -hmm. but I know how it felt. Uh, and so that one year, I didn't feel any overt host host hostility. We made a lot of friends. We were included in a lot of things, but little subtle things like we were very much um, recruited and eager. I mean, it was an eager welcoming for us to play sports, basketball and football and run track. Uh, that same eager re reception didn't carry over to the Honor Society uh, and the available scholarships. It just wasn't, just felt again like being displaced as seniors. Uh, in one, in During his interview with Dr. Our, Moy, our, Tucker goes on to talk about other challenges that members of Fort Worth's African American community faced. There were infrastructure disparities, like a lack of storm drainage in the southeast sector that caused water to pool so substantially residents could catch crawdads in their neighborhoods. For many grassroots organizers like himself, calls for equity were met with both covert and overt threats. The issues that Tucker and others in the Civil Rights and Black and Brown Project describe ring with an eerie familiarity, Dr. Moy says. So many of the local campaigns that, uh, that we documented in this project had to do with police violence and uh, just the, the millions of indignities that, that police forces um, um, foisted upon their, upon their communities, uh, Houston and Dallas and uh, Lubbock and, um, and the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and, you know, in, in, in so many ways, the issues that, that people are fighting for are, are the issues that, that they've been fighting for and, and the conditions that they've been fighting against for half a century. About 40 minutes away from Fort Worth, in the city of DeSoto, J. Anthony Guillory is a witness to those disparities virtually every day. A Texas native, Dr. Guillory earned his PhD in African American Studies from the University of Massachusetts, and this spring joined the UNT History Department as a lecturer and advisor to the African American Studies minor. One of his research interests is the social, cultural, and political developments that shaped the history of Oak Cliff, a predominantly African-American suburb of Dallas. In the latter half of the 20th century, many Oak Cliff residents migrated to cities like DeSoto to pursue better opportunities in communities where they wouldn't be ostracized. DeSoto is an interesting space because it's perceived as this Black middle class affluent area where you know people who wanted to buy homes but they didn't want to live in the hood right the ghetto or you know uh, or what we would characterize pleasant grove or oak cliff right um and so they move here 
Um, and they're, you know, this is their e effort to like capture the American dream, if you will. What I find though, living here in a townhouse where I rent, I live around other poor black people who move to the area with their children, believing that if they fought tooth and tooth and nail, that they can get their kids into a better school district, right? But unfortunately, the school district isn't that much better than the the school districts from, uh, representing the communities that they left. And uh, so this is perceived as you know Cedar Hill, Duncanville, DeSoto. These are you know considered like the black mecca, right? But because of my experience living here in the townhouse, I get to see what the other black folk get to experience. And, you know, it's not that great for them. So what does it mean that 155 years after the ratification of the 13th Amendment, 66 years after Brown v. Board of Education, and 56 years after the signing of the Civil Rights Act, equity is still more dream than reality? Maybe says Christopher Todd, an assistant professor in UNT's Department of History. It's because history isn't linear, or at the very least, its trajectory isn't always up. It's subject to um, some reversals, um, unfortunately. Um, and we're in a time of um, deep reversal, I think, um, at this moment. And I think the only way in which that struggle can be uh, sustained is through uh, struggle, it, the struggle itself, constant struggle, and not allowing individuals to, um, to steal our progress. And that's what today's episode of UNT Pod is all about. Where we are, how we got here, and how all of us can and should move forward together to build a stronger, more equitable world. Join me, Erin Cristalis, and Drs. Guillory, Moy, and Todd as they share their thoughts on how the lessons we're willing to learn from the past and the present can illuminate, even in the darkest of times, a path to a better future. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We're tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? It is now our generation's task to carry on what those pioneers began. George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd! They were the final words of more than 70 people over the past decade who died in law enforcement custody, more than half of them Black, and the majority stopped for nonviolent offenses. This spring, the heartbreaking words were uttered over and over again by George Floyd as a Minneapolis police officer knelt on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. It's hard to listen to and nearly impossible to watch. But that brutality broke through the larger American consciousness, specifically that of white Americans, in a way that the other questionable fatalities that have piled up over the years did not. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Samuel DuBose, Freddie Gray, Alton Sterling, Orlando Castile, Jordan Edwards, Elijah McLean, Breonna Taylor. Seeing George Floyd get killed in the street resonated in a way that rhetoric just simply didn't. It's unfortunate to say that. I know that that's probably, you know, um, a very controversial statement, but I, 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 I think it's true. I, I just don't think that other, com other groups of people understood what Black Lives Matter meant until that moment. And there was a level of shared guilt that served as a motivating force. And while he says that same sense of shared guilt is part of what brought white activists to the South in the mid-20th century, Dr. Guillory bristles at the temptation to draw a direct comparison between the modern Black Lives Matter movement and the classical period of civil rights, 
considering the differing geopolitical climates of each era. If history isn't necessarily cyclical, and certainly not, as Dr. Todd explained, an upward trajectory, maybe it's more like a tree with branches that bend and curve through time. And slavery comprises the roots, an injustice so devastating and so insidious that its effects still form the base of modern race relations. Slavery as a social institution marked individuals um, uh, who belonged from those who didn't belong. And the transatlantic slave trade with, its, with the emergence of ideas of race permanently marked individuals outside of that compact. Look, right after um, the ending of slavery in the United States, the first things that many um, white Americans wanted to do was to repatriate black people to the lands in which they came from. Their existence w was deemed to be incompatible, for instance, according to Thomas Jefferson, incompatible with um, life in um, a white nation. Dr. Todd, who joined the UNT faculty this fall, specializes in topics including slavery, early America, and African-American and Afro-Caribbean history. He says the common thread that runs through slavery and post-slavery societies, regardless of geography, is the denial of full citizenship through tactics such as the restriction of voting rights or land ownership. A land that is ostensibly, you know, its governing document is founded in the notions of equality and the rule of law applying to all of its citizens. Being able to deny African Americans um, equal treatment based on their race was an important, an extremely important tool in allowing um, ex-masters to capture the labor of of individuals, and it went beyond labor as well, right? Because not being part of the social compact um, was a way of uh, uh, keeping African Americans, um, well, let me not be ginger, in their place, right? And an added benefit, if you can call it that, of the transatlantic slave trade is that the tight association um, between people of African descent and slavery left them vulnerable even after slavery ended. It allowed these kinds of legal and extra legal um, systems to develop even after slavery. Its effects, we um, can see, have last, lasted well into the 20th century, unfortunately. Those sentiments were echoed by author and activist James Baldwin 55 years ago in his famous Cambridge Union debate with conservative author and commentator William F. Buckley Jr. The motion of the debate stated that the American dream was at the expense of Black Americans, with Baldwin arguing for and Buckley against. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. I am stating very seriously, and this is not an overstatement, I picked the cotton, and I carried it to market, and I built the railroad under someone else's whip for nothing, for nothing. Baldwin's shift from second to first person was to emphasize that white supremacy was not a relic of the past. He'd later state that the quote, True horror is that America changes all the time without ever changing at all. Baldwin believed that we're all complicit in injustice and that we all have a responsibility to fight against it. That includes individuals and the institutions they comprise, that those who have most benefited from perpetuating divisiveness must now play a key role in creating unity. But how exactly does that process even begin? Part of the answer, Dr. Guillory says, is by reconciling African-American history with the larger story of American history. After earning his PhD in African-American studies, he began interviewing at universities for history positions and was frequently told that he wasn't qualified because his PhD wasn't in US history. 
When he moved back to Texas, he took a job in a local school district where the absence of African-American figures from history textbooks was undeniably obvious. And I can tell you that, you know, all of a sudden, Black people just show up in Texas, right? Like, they weren't there at the beginning of the narrative, right? Um, and then they, they, they make it a, an appearance, and then they go away, <laughs> and then they come back during slavery, and then they go away, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I definitely think that there are people who, and, and this, is a, 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 this is both in primary and secondary ed, but also in higher ed, there's some people who think that um, by focusing on African, the African-American experience, you don't know U.S. history, right? Um, and then there's also people who view African-American history uh, through some type of contributionist lens, right? And so, you know, there are moments when we talk about Black people, but otherwise, you know, the, the, the presupposition is that we're talking about, you know, European Americans. But historians and history books aren't the only way perceptions of history are formed. Popular media has long played a role in shaping perspectives, both for better and for worse. D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, for example, played a role in reviving the Ku Klux Klan through its denigration of Reconstruction-era African Americans. Numerous studies have found that media representations of the Black community, and especially Black men, are distorted. But there have been notable entries over the past decade that have contributed to more fully realized on-screen representations. Moonlight, for example, a film that followed a gay Black male from his adolescence into adulthood, won the Best Picture Oscar in 2017. Jordan Peele's Get Out, a box office behemoth, fused terror and racial satire, and his follow-up Us uses terror as a metaphor for America's willingness to turn a blind eye to the many injustices lingering just below its surface. Ava DuVernay's documentary 13th casts new light on post-slavery experiences, and her four-part Netflix series, When They See Us, showed how the now-exonerated Central Park Five were railroaded into confessing to a violent crime they didn't commit. This is why I think it's so important that you have individuals, and not necessarily even just people of color, but everyone who can produce um, an, an historically and empirically informed narratives, cultural narratives, that we can consume. Right. So, for instance, Toni Morrison's uh, Beloved, right, telling the story of Margaret Garner is a powerful refutation, I think, in some ways, of the Moonlight and Magnolia um, narrative that you would receive in something like Gone with the Wind. Frankly, most people don't read historical narratives, right? Much of the ways in which they receive and understand history comes through cultural production. Again, these things are part of the kind of hegemonic struggle around creating positive narratives, narratives that see people like me as a citizen um, of this nation. To encourage greater diversity in the film industry, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences recently announced new representation and inclusion standards for eligibility in the Oscars Best Picture category as part of its Academy Aperture 2025 initiative. The standards are designed to encourage equitable representation on and off screen in order to better reflect the diversity of the movie going audience. But those conversations extend far beyond the realm of entertainment, and in many ways, much closer to home. Though the discussions are no doubt imperfect, institutes of higher education have begun to explore on a deeper level how to better enact policies that promote equity. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, for example, UNT President Neil Smotresk hosted town halls with students, staff, and faculty about how the university can best strive to meet the needs of the entire Mean Green community. For Dr. Guillory, the most important step is to bring more people to the table. And if there's no room left at the table, take a good long look at who's there and who isn't. What I have seen on the job market since 2008 is that oftentimes, there's a position in African-American literature or African-American studies or African-American history, and that's the attempt to diversify the faculty, right? Um, that's problematic, right? Because, you know, Black folk can do other things besides teach about Black folk things, right? Like, we, can, we, we have Black economists, and, you know, we have African-American political scientists, and we have African-American biologists and nurses and, you know, medical doctors, right? Like, they can... They can do other things. If you are trying to recruit 
black students, particularly from the inner city, who look at college as a way for them to improve their socioeconomic position. You need to demonstrate to these black students that they can go into professions where they can actually change their socioeconomic position. I mean, you can create generational wealth in a lifetime. And you know you can drastically change not only your condition but the conditions of people from your original community, right? Um, but that happens and can only happen if students of color see people that look like them doing that work. Uh, without that, you know, you're asking you know people to have an imagination about something that they did not even conceive of prior to. And that commitment to ensuring college classrooms include an array of people, experiences, and opinions can lead to mind-opening encounters, Dr. Todd says. I remember, um, this is a long time ago now, um, and I don't even remember what we were talking about at all. I just remember the feeling that I got. Um, We were discussing something in a class, this was a graduate class, and this young woman, and you know, of course, you know, you're, you're in graduate school and you know, oh, you know, the professor asks a question and you're like, oh, yes, well, of course, it's X, Y, and Z. And then this young woman spoke up, don't remember her face, don't remember what she looked like, anything. And she said something that, that just did not cross my mind. And my mind was just blown. I just remember the feeling that I had never considered this, right? For whatever reason, whether it's because of who, who I am or whatever it is, I had never considered this um, before, but I just remember thinking, wow. The process of including and absorbing more perspective starts with listening, Dr. Moy says, but it certainly doesn't end there. It starts with honestly soliciting, um, you know, the, the opinions and the experiences of minority students and faculty and staff members and, and members of the community. It, it has to include um, just an ironclad commitment to equity as well as diversity, um, to you know, producing outcomes that are equitable, uh, not just opportunities that are equitable, but, uh, but outcomes. I'll say, I'll say as, a, as a white faculty member, it requires uh, not responding to, to what you hear when you do listen um, defensively. If you're committed to these sorts of changes, it requires um, you know, just, just a basic understanding that you have a lot to unlearn yourself. Um, that's certainly how I approach it. I, I was born in Louisiana, raised in Georgia um, in the 1970s and 1980s. So I, I understand that I accepted a lot of things that uh, are no longer acceptable. And so I have to unlearn those things. Uh, lots of university administrators um, were, were raised in conditions like that and, th- and they have a lot to unlearn. So I think if you can approach it from, from that understanding and uh, commit yourself to not behaving defensively when, when um, your own shortcomings are, are brought up, um, I, I think that's important as well. Dr. Moy has a long history of shedding light on important events in local African-American history. He and his students have created extensive databases about the 1956 integration of Mansfield High School and St. John's, a disappeared freedmen's community near Pilot Point. He was first drawn to study civil rights as a kid growing up in Atlanta, where John Lewis was his congressman and Andrew Young served as mayor. He also was inspired by the activism of members in his own family, who taught him that white Americans have an important role to play in civil rights movements just not the starring role? Uh, White people can certainly play an important role. Um, I I just personally hope that um, they they go into it looking to find ways that they can support the movement rather than uh, get out in front of movements and and speak for movements because that's not not what we need at this point from my perspective. they can uh, they can certainly do that in protest movements, but they also have roles to play in their neighborhood associations and in their PTAs and at their places of business. Um, so you can you can certainly commit to um, creating a more equitable school, more equitable neighborhood, more equitable corporation, um, more equitable city, 
through your, your civic participation. And I would like to think that that's one of the things that's happening now is that there's, there's a renewal to that sort of participation and, and, and a renewed commitment to that kind of anti-racist activism and behavior. In June, faculty from across UNT's history department worked together to create an anti-racism syllabus titled Decriminalizing Blackness that was made available to the public. The course highlights Black voices to help learners understand racism from history to the present day. That kind of cross-cultural buy-in is what can ultimately turn outcry into victory, Dr. Guillory says. It's, it's critical for the purposes of, you know, framing your message, for the purposes of, you know, uh, resources, right, resource mobilization. Um, but then also, you know, just for the standpoint of changing the, the the American conscious, you, you have to have buy-in from multiple groups. This, this is not something that um, African-Americans can shoulder on their own and, and expect any type of change that doesn't result in, you know, tragedy. So once you've secured that buy-in, what's the next step? That question rose to the surface after the July 17th death of Congressman John Lewis, a towering figure of the civil rights movement who was beaten and bloodied, but not defeated, during the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Following his passing, a clip of one of his most famous sound bites was frequently broadcast. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, yeah. not just, something. Do something. Get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary. But it was one of his most fiery speeches, delivered during the 1963 March on Washington, that perhaps inspired his generation of civil rights activists, and now a new one, to demand change in no uncertain terms. Today for jobs and freedom. But we have nothing to be proud of. But hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here. But they're receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. Those who have said be patient and wait, we must say that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. There have been protests and boycotts against injustice, which have served as important tools as far back as slaves demanding pay during the Haitian Revolution, to as recently as sponsors boycotting the Washington Redskins, an NBA player striking after the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. But considering that steps forward are inevitably met with pushback, how can history finally move closer to an upward trajectory? I wonder too, because it feels like a lot of progress that gets made is kind of met by this sort of coded legislation or political strategy, whether it's the Southern strategy or the war on drugs or three strikes and you're out. Mm -hmm. How can people work together to face those kinds of things head on that aren't necessarily as obvious as just outright racism? So this is where deliberate practice and deliberate action is um, critical. We, we need to seek out education on what has transpired in the past. We need to understand in context, how things unfold, how things occurred and, and, how, and why they unfolded the way that they did. We, we need to do that work first, right? We're, we're very, very uneducated on um, most of the things you just listed, right? Southern strategy, the, the policy of benign neglect, which I think, you know, like it's, if it was a movie, it would be perfect, right? But because it happened in real life, you like it, it you know, it, it makes you mad. There has to be work done to educate ourselves on when things change and how they change and then what would curb that change. And then we have to do the work of electing local and state representatives, right, who reflect the analyses of our studies, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it means, you know, less time in front of the television you know, being entertained in more time, right, doing the work of actually making your society better. After all, if we can't learn from our past mistakes and muster the courage to speak up for what's right, 
will anything ever really change? Constant refrain that you see on YouTube, you know, if you don't like it, go back to where you came from. It indicates to me that there is a certain um, willingness of people to see people as not belonging, right? There's a, there's a way that um, it's an automatic and reflexive kind of way of understanding people who look like me as not totally belonging at some level. So for instance, one of the reasons I think an individual can put his knee on someone's neck and be filmed uh, is that he believes that there's a certain support for the things that he do, does, that individuals are not going to um, complain too loudly, that he can get away with that. Because other people are not going to say, what the hell is going on here? I'm not necessarily so afraid of the police themselves. The thing that I fear is that if something happens to me, um, is that people will look at me and there won't be an outcry because other people won't say this, something is wrong here and it needs to be solved. James Baldwin once said, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means that you have agreed that human life is an academic matter. So I'm forced to be an optimist. I'm forced to believe that we can survive whatever we must survive. He took a short pause then spoke a hard truth. The future of Black Americans is as bright or as dark as the future of America itself. It is entirely up to the American people and our representatives. It is entirely up to the American people whether or not they're going to face and deal with and embrace this stranger whom they rely on so long. Is that day finally arriving? It's up to all of us, Dr. Guillory says, to ensure that question can finally be answered with some real optimism. I'm, I'm optimistic about the moment because, you know, people are glued in. They, and they, and they, they've demonstrated that they genuinely want to make something better. It encourages me to, you know, put forth a tremendous amount of effort into not only my classroom teaching, but, you know, public engagement, right? So, you know, you, you know, you reach out to me and you, you say you want to talk, you know, heck yeah, I'm talking to you, right? I, absolutely I am. Um, and if I say anything, right, that could be useful, right, then I'm all for it because, um, like I said, there's the, the, the climate is such that we are in a space where we can have these conversations and people are more willing to grit their teeth and, and actually listen. Um, and hear these hard truths and to engage people on experiences that are completely foreign to their own. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really optimistic about that. And, you know, it's just important that we maximize the moment and, you know, and understand that the moment is not going to be here forever. Thank you for listening to UNT Pod. To view the History Department's anti-racism syllabus and UNT's new diversity and inclusion initiatives, please see the link in our show notes. You can also find a link in our show notes to Dr. Guillory discussing some of his favorite works of African-American literature, including George Schuyler's racial satire, Black No More. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at UNT Social and on Instagram at UNT. Until next time, be safe.